Okay, guys, good morning. Morning, morning. Do you sleep okay? Yeah. 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 Very good. I slept a bit. Not tons. But, uh, yeah, so the, the camera's running. I'm going to put this on, on YouTube. People like to watch these talks sometimes and the, the random bits of information. And let's just go through a little bit uh, what we did yesterday. I think it's going to fall apart before I can do that. But. <laughs> Anxiety, we were looking at anxiety and the idea, you know, but how anxiety appears for many of us, different ways that it kind of manifests in our body or in our mind, in our behaviour. And then looking a little bit, what's anxiety really about, you know, what's it really about that we have this fear created by the sheer level of repression in our system really go out into the world and expand and explore ourselves at some point we come to anxiety and most people will move back most people will move back to what they know what is safe and in this way in many ways our planet doesn't really develop you know it doesn't develop it just everyone stays safe in a certain way and fantasizes about safety and then there's a little sort of model about how the defensive system works which is it can be very useful if you're trying to work on your own a lot, which a lot of people are these days, and that's, that's good. But it's very hard to develop on your own unless you've got a bit of a, a, a really a vigilant part of yourself inside that's calling you on whether you're, whether you're really standing up for yourself in this moment or whether you're getting out of something in this moment. And sometimes it's also difficult to anyway know. You know? So that's one of the, the main challenges that I see in working a lot on your own with therapy, bioenergetics, or whatever you're trying to do. But when you reach that kind of, those critical points when you will normally pull out of, a, pull out of something, can you stay with it? And how do you really know that that's the point where, you, where you've got to do this if you're not around people who are experienced? You know? And understanding our, how our brain operates in defensive mode, so to speak, can be useful and we can, we can use that as a signpost to say, whoa, I'm getting defensive now. What's going on emotionally underneath that? Did we do anything else? No. <laughs> well, I thought I'd just talk a little bit to look mostly at underachievement, but initially a little bit. It's something, I don't know, that always fascinated me. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of like spiritual development, but when I got involved uh, with Osho and the Osho scene, and I never met Osho, you know, I didn't get into Osho till like about 10 years after he had died. Uh, and there were still a lot of his followers around London doing groups and stuff like that. And I thought, it, wow, this is fucking awesome. But I guess my only understanding of spirituality, having been in Kabbalah and a little bit and stuff like that a little bit before, these kind of, but all these other spiritual development systems, most of them seem kind of rigid and... I guess historically from a bloke called Patanjali, no one really knows where he lived, when he lived, maybe 2,000 years ago, maybe a bit earlier or later or whatever. But he wrote a book which was, became called, I think, Seven Steps to Enlightenment or Seven Steps of Vedanta or something like this. And he kind of introduced into how we are now the Western mindset the idea of graduated development. You know, that you start from somewhere and then you get to the next level, you get to the next level. Some belief systems, you know, you start from the base chakra, then you get to the second, then you get to this or whatever. Models and systems, you know, and uh, they're very appealing to a certain kind of mind, you know. Someone, usually to people who are very mind-orientated, you know. I was very mind-orientated and this was kind of appealing, you know, the idea. It was safe, you know, you'd start from here, then you got to here, then the next step where you get to here, then you get to here. And when I became more involved with the Osho scene, I realised that it was functioning on a totally... He had no interest in this. He had no interest in this graduated development. And his approach was what some people call more dialectical, in that he would, you know, every day give discourses. One day a discourse would be, you know, life is like this and what you need to do is be like this and, you know, then be like this and you have to be this and that and the other. And the next, and everyone would take that in, all his disciples, thousands of people in Pune. Uh, he wasn't talking so much in Oregon. And then the next day he'd come up and give a discourse and it would be utterly contradictory, utterly contradictory. You know, he would just start speaking what came out of his mouth and you could see the, the, the sannyasins, you know, would be like, what the fuck? 
but I, you know, I've just been practicing for the last 24 hours being like this, I'm trying to be like this, and now you're saying that's a little bollocks and you've got to be like this. And, and at some point you started to explain kind of what was going on and, 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 and maybe you can even work it out, but his approach was more to confront the, the vast holding pattern of the mind, of mental activity, of an egoic self, you know, by, by giving one teaching in one direction and then giving another teaching in another direction. And this kind of dialectical approach suits body-based therapy because in many ways what you're trying to do is get more awareness in the body and the more awareness you have in the body, particularly the belly, the less you need belief systems. Mm. You just don't really need them so much. Or they can be very flexible. One day you can totally believe this, and the next day you think, no, you just wake up and oh, I totally believe this now. You know, I mean, totally go, I, I'm like this, you know, I'm like this completely. You know, one, one minute I'm believing something and totally into it, and then it's dropped and I'm just going in a completely different direction. And on some levels that can be frustrating. But it's also, there's a kind of, I don't know, there's a kind of a natural innocence in it somewhere as well, you know. So I wanted to mention this because this is like a big, a big area and really in how the body works as well. But when you have awareness in the body, you, you just don't need so many belief systems or thoughts or ideas. And it is not for everybody. Some people will prefer to have more graduated kind of things where they know the reference points know the reference points for me it was very challenging but very exciting you know because I was so mind-centered it was very exciting to be in an environment where everything was seem to be changing all the fucking time you know it was like but my reference points were all getting mashed up because I was so used to having fixed reference points that at some point I got really bored of it you know so having said that I wanted to look a little bit at underachievement because I think like it's been a big theme in my own personal life, you know, struggling to step up and achieve something and feeling competitive and jealous towards men or sometimes women who, I, who in my perception were doing better than me, mm -hmm. you know, and... It's something that I want to ask uh, from time to time, but I really cut myself whether or not I'm saying with people or, that, like, or even with my friends, that if somebody, like the thing that you said, is getting like better than me even if it's not getting better it's like very friendly and consciously I caught my, I caught myself I'm comparing myself to that person yeah. and that has like self-hate towards me but also like kind of sort of hate or anger towards the person but well, you, don't, you, don't, you don't know what it has unless you investigate it yeah because uh, I mean what I was going to say is like you know competitive competitive instinct can be really useful you know if I look back at my life the times yeah. when I've been competitive often have been useful you know, like, and, and to, to feel jealousy. When I first started doing group therapy, I felt like I was at the bottom of the fucking league table, all the guys in the room. There were several guys who were a lot younger, in my estimation, much better looking than me. I'd already figured out who the prettiest girls in the group were, yeah. and basically figured I hadn't got much chance with any of them. So, you know, focus lower down the great league table of sexuality, whatever, you know, this kind of, these kind of models were very, very inherent in my brain at the time, and, and all of this kind of stuff. But it also was, it was useful for me as well, in, in, in a sense, but it kind of motivated me to keep moving forwards in a way yeah. and, and stuff like that. So having a drive, let's say, uh, for my case, like, you know, I'm a bit of young, it's not bad. It can actually, you think, like, help me to maybe achieve something if I put Well, as long as you do get, as long as you do step up and, and meet step the challenge, yeah, yeah, you know, in, in a healthy way, mm -hmm. in a healthy way. Yeah, I like that approach. Yeah. So. Yeah. Where were we? I mean, I was last trying to that too. What were you trying to Yes, what was I trying to say? We were looking at underachievement. Yes. What did I say before that? I think what I was going to say anyway was like, in my own life, you know, I see that there's been a lot of underachievement or I have a sense of underachieving a lot of time for a long time. And I still do quite often, not habitually all the time, but uh, it's a repetitive kind of theme. Or I see someone on YouTube like... Uh, there's guys I know there personally who are quite high up in the personal development movement in California, America and stuff like that. And I think, fuck, they're really doing it, man. Why aren't I doing that, you know? And this kind of thing. And, and then it's useful for me to look to see, hey, what, what actually do, where do I want to step up? You know, rather than being some kind of, I'm not good enough, beat myself up, think, where do I want to step up? Mm -hmm. And I think this also for me, this interest in, in underachievement, I, 
you know, I was never super involved in what was called the human potential movement, which came out of, of the States. You yes, probably yeah. know more about it and stuff like that. But what I became aware of doing group therapy was there's a fuck of a lot of in, in potential inside of every human being. You know, it's like fucking huge. And then, and then it doesn't seem to manifest in very many people, very many people. You know, I, I never liked America so much when I was younger and I always bought the kind of European narratives about it all being arrogant and controlling and, and, and stuff like that. And nowadays I quite like America. In that I see that there are some absolutely incredible people that come up through the American system who are just like complete world leaders and, and, and amazing beings. And at the same time, yes, there's a lot of people scrabbling around, not getting very far and whining and stuffing themselves with food from Walmart, you know. But like... Uh, there is also this incredible potential. And then the question in my mind is, so why do so few people ever, is that just how it is? Is that just how it is? It's only one person in a million that ever really steps up? Or is there some way that we could all, more people could step up, or we could all step up and really, really achieve? And I think somewhere in my heart, you know, I see that my own belief system is that this is what life is really about. You know, it's not about creating a steady state. This is only my own personal belief system. It's not about saving the planet so much. It's not about any of these things. It's about unlocking what is the full potential of human beings and how do we maximise that for the maximum number of people. You know? And that, I think, as I see Osho, wasn't the only strand in his, in his work, but it was a deep strand. You know, even though when he ended up in Oregon for five years in the late 80s or, or early 80s, you know, he was... Um, uh, he was in silence most of the time, and uh, no one knows so much what the fuck was really going on, even though there were thousands of people in his commune. It seemed as though he was trying to create something new for the planet, an environment where people could really develop into. This was what the world was really about, developing. So with these strands of thinking going on in my mind, I started to sort of study underachievement a bit, you know, and try to, try to work things out. And I'm, by no means could I call this a masterclass, but certain things I kind of became aware of that were, were, were dominant. And I'll just share some of that stuff and feel free to uh, ask questions or whatever. One thing we started to talk about yesterday, I'm going to draw another really bad picture of a human, particularly bad, wow. was this idea, you know, but we would... It's why, why do we... Um, the idea that there's a lot of repression, particularly maybe around the back of the body, back of the legs, but these are kind of dumping areas for the ego essentially, mm -hmm. where all the bits of ourselves that we don't really want to show to other people, don't really even want to feel often in our own being, you know, we dump these and they become holding patterns or dead areas in the, in, in the body, in the muscle system. And also that these holding areas exert like a kind of charge, rather like an electrical charge. And this is interesting when you start to consider with the positivity in the human potential movement, what it initially started and where, where it still is for most of it is, you know, coming together in a seminar, like an Anthony Robbins seminar at the, at the Wembley Arena, 9,000 people for four days, walking on fire, you know, uh, arrow breaking exercises. I, I've done this stuff, you know, it's like, it's great. You know, you walk over fire for like 30 metres and you think, Jesus Christ, if I can do that, I can fucking do anything. You know, it's like something where your mind is saying, do not do that. Arrow break. Anyone did arrow break exercise? No. no. Again, arrow points. Yeah. And it's put on there, and someone else is holding up a board with the bottom of the arrow. And when I first had to do this, the only narrative in my mind was, there's still time to get out, get the fuck out of here now. You cannot do this, you know. It's a totally razor-sharp fucking arrow. It's pushed right in here, and you have to lean forwards in a trust, in a trust movement against... So you think the arrow is going to go straight through your windpipe, and it doesn't. The arrow bends, and it breaks, basically. And it's another one of these exercises where where, you know, it's like a breakthrough exercise where your mind has a self-limiting belief. You go through the self-limiting belief and you come out thinking, yeah, I can fucking do it. And so, although I never went to see Anthony Robbins at the, at the London Arena, a lot, of my, a lot of friends of mine did and stuff like that, I had the kind of expectation they would come out super pumped up and charged and like, I can do fucking anything in the world, you know, and then... But what I noticed was, from people I knew, within about a month, they'd all be back to their normal day-to-day -day kind of belief systems and life. And in my own kind of underachieving mind, I drew some pleasure from that, thinking that at least they haven't got ahead of me, if a few of you can relate to that idea, you know. 
it would have been much harder to, to, to deal with the fact that they were all now kind of running big companies or being super powerful fitness trainers or, or yoga teachers or whatever, you know, empowered women. But I became also, and another guy I spoke to who had been involved in this movement for quite a long time uh, recently, another trainer, and I was chatting to him and, and he said, yeah, there's even hard statistics that, you know, 98, 99% of people will go on one month for straight back to, to zero and, and or, or where they were before. And I was interested, you know, why is this happening? Why, when the mind is so positive, does it fall back so much? And one answer for me is definitely in this charge in the body and the fact that our brain developed over different, uh, uh, different periods of time, essentially an evolutionary time. We've got the brain stem down here, the kind of reptilian part of the brain. And this theory isn't totally dominant these days, but it's still largely accepted. And then you've got the midbrain, the kind of, uh, the, in many ways, the emotional brain, uh, the amygdala, the limbic system, kind of in the middle here, paleomammalian brain, they call it. And then with humans, you've got this very developed neocortex, frontal lobes, prefrontal cortex. And what, where Anthony Robbins and a lot of these, these positivity gurus were working is up here, basically, with the image of self, you know, the person I think I am, the person I want to be, the kind of person. Changing that person from maybe a defended, contracted negative. I was a contracted negative sense of self when I started to do groups. And expanding that idea of who you are into like a, you know, I can do it kind of person. A loving, powerful, beautiful human being who can move out into the world. And so people would come out of the Wembley Arena in this belief, you know, I'm going up from here, prefrontal cortex. But within a month they were back down. And, and the reason for me why that is, or certainly one of the reasons is, you've got to look at the midbrain here in the middle and the role of the midbrain, one of its jobs in the brain is to re-establish integrity or balance into your, into your body, into your body schema, your, your feeling of your body, essentially. And in animals, how it does this, if you've been through like an animal's had a shock, or it's just encountered a scary predator, it's just had a life and death experience, quite easy for a lot of animals to experience this. And then sometimes it'll make the animal make sound or make the animal shake. You know, the shaking is to, is to get the holding that's been temporarily put in its muscle system out, basically. Humans have a far more developed ego up here from the prefrontal cortex, and so they tend not to release. They tend to learn to negotiate and, 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 and manipulate and move their way around the areas of the holding in their body. But the problem is, these areas exert a charge. The job of this part of the brain is to get this shit out of your body. And how it does it, it doesn't lead you to bioenergetics classes because it's not so mental, it doesn't know these things. How it does it, it's got control over a lot of your instinctual drives, you know, around sexuality, mm -hmm. around power structures, areas where our genetic history really comes into, uh, our evolutionary history really comes into force. And basically, it tries to pull us back into the shit. Mm -hmm. It tries to pull us back into the conflicts that caused us to get into here on some symbolic level in the sense that you know maybe you've been working for a company and you really hate the fucking boss you know he's such a fucking arsehole you can't get on with him he's a real twat and at some point you think right this is not doing me any good I'm going to leave this company leave the company feels much better you get a job in a new company and it's all blissful at first you're really getting on with the boss it's a woman this time she's great she's much more open two months down the line she starts really pissing you off you know always telling me what to do all the same the same problem re-manifests you know I go and move to another company and the same problem comes back and mm -hmm. uh, maybe with a partner you pick as a guy you pick a certain type of woman or maybe a woman you pick a certain type of guy and you're just attracted to that kind of guy and you know you're with him and then you know it starts to fall apart old dynamics it's not really working come out you're going to get a new type of guy this time end up with the same type of guy it's like yeah it's something that i wanted to ask i know by from therapy that uh, for me personally i'm realizing that sometimes like maybe unconsciously i'm attracting like to girls that they have just like a lot of drama like it always appears like the story is like it's very pleasant at the start but as like you said as the time goes on Drama starts to kick in. Yeah, we're going to look at why that is. Uh huh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you want to say something? No. no. And, 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 and why it is, is because, because of all this charge in the body from the muscle system, 
this part of the brain keeps trying to drag you back into the old conflicts. So you find someone else who's further up the hierarchy than you. First of all, it's great. Then it starts operating again. And it basically, you, sit, you find yourself in the same old conflict. And, you know, you may be really trying to move positive out in the world. You know, I really want to do the best for myself. But whilst this charge is sitting in your body, it's got hold of your instinctual drives and it'll keep pulling you back down. And it can be useful to understand this for several reasons. One of which, you know, if you really want to develop, it's in your interest to try and take this repressive charge out, you know, with the bioenergetics or emotional expression or, or whatever therapy you come to. Some people use more massage, myofascial release type stuff. Try and take this charge permanently out of the muscle system so the muscles return to their natural kind of fluidity and resilience, essentially. And, and also because what happens to a lot of people in positivity is that they end up beating themselves up because they didn't achieve what they, what, what they, you know, they came out of a group room ready to take on the world. A month later, they're back in their fucking bed sit and it's all blah, blah, and they're just in the same old addictive behaviours with their phone and, and whatever. And they beat themselves up and they don't understand. But because of this charge, you know, it, 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 it'll keep on trying to pull you back into the shit. It'll keep on trying to pull you back into the shit. Into situations which symbolically resemble somewhere the situations where you ended up, ended up storing all the crap. And so a lot of people in life, they're trying to move forwards, they've got their foot on the gas pedal, and they're constantly being pulled back, forwards, back, and they're going in this kind of, yeah, up and down motion. Where, do, where does habit come into this? Because habits, habits aren't necessarily stored in that location either, are they? Am I, am I getting to, am I going back into the mind? Mm. Point, or what's your view on habits? Just the fact that sometimes it's just repetitive of nature, something that's, that you've done. I guess it depends on their conscious habits, which are really serving you, you know, like to always have a shower in the morning or to always do some level of exercise to get yourself clear, or whether they're unconscious habits where you just feel you need to go back in this repetitive cycle or something. And we looked a little bit on, on day one, I think it was, that with these unconscious habits, you know, they're kind of a, a ritual behaviours can also keep us not feeling, you know, that there's this underlying charge here and the underlying anxiety and and discomfort that it's creating constantly in our lives. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Does that is that useful? Yeah, I suppose you get a bit of a dopamine, don't you, from your habits. Um, it's like could if, be if you bang your head against a wall for six years, you probably miss it after you stop if you stop getting some sort of release from it. Uh, I guess I haven't tried it, but uh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. So this is one thing, you know, where understanding can be useful. And I think if enough people in the, in the kind of positivity movement start to grasp this, you know, you, it, it'll be very, very useful for them. Another thing when we look at underachievement, I think is something I really became aware of living like over 15 years here, is that a lot of people who are quite, you know, uh, together out in the world, we get a lot of people from um, human resources, social work, you know, senior social workers, people, people in all walks of life come through the door, a lot of people from caring industries as well. People, I'd often see people who I knew out in the world had very, quite high profile jobs with good wages and were really together. And as soon as they walk through the, the red doors here, they seem to just go into what I'd, I'd started to term child mode. And And, you know, then I'd be like, halfway through running a 10-day sexuality festival or something like this, and I've got people coming up to me in this kind of, uh, you know, like a six-year-old boy or something like that, coming up, going on about, oh, I just saw this really great jacket in the, in the theatre cupboard, can I, can, can I just take it? Can I just take it? Or something like that. Or, or going into the office all the time and constantly asking questions that, and that their adult self could easily answer, you know, could easily answer, you know. And... and People just seem to really go into child mode a lot of the time. And uh, I became kind of fascinated for a while with this concept and, and uh, leading events. I started to talk about it and to get people out of child mode to take more responsibility. But I think it also refers to the fact that many people have not had a proper childhood or a proper adolescence in many ways. And are not really ready in a sense to go out in the world and they're just struggling to get it together. You know, and keeping it together one way or the other. But they are, in a sense, not really ready. 
and 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 uh, I mentioned that, but there's another aspect to child mode on a psychological level, which is kind of which is kind of useful to understand. I find in the because in early childhood it's so easy to get triggered and so easy to to hold trauma in the body because we can't always express, or there are these defensive functions in the brain blocking our expression sometimes, and the traumatic child gets held. Certain behaviours, when, when it's triggered again from the outside, when we're an adult, when the same triggers come in, like uh, the dad being too harsh, or something like that, or, or, or whatever, the brain goes back into this kind of childhood behaviour mode, and one of the features of childhood is that we need to receive a lot from the outside, mm -hmm. you know? We need to receive a lot from the outside. And one of the features of adulthood is that we need to communicate what we need, you know, to take responsibility for what we need. But when triggered back into child mode, most humans will not communicate what is going on or what they need. They will simply expect other people around them to see them and to give them what they need. Because as children, that's how your, your genes condition you to be. The genes condition you to be. And very often in relationships, if you've done relationship counselling or been in a lot of relationships or that, you will see this going on where one partner is, you know, really not happy about something that's going on in the relationship with the other, with the other partner. But they don't communicate that. They're back in child mode and the, when, when you're doing counselling and stuff, very often you hear, they should just see me. They should just see what's going on and do it. They should just stop. They should just stop. And that's the child. That's the child because up until around the age of five, we're conditioned to, to need to receive a lot from the outside. Mm -hmm. can see. So it can be useful to understand this because when we look at underachievement, often you know, the expectation is that society should give it to us, it should do it for us. You know? Or that other people should just see where we're at and give us what we need. When we're stuck in child mode, we believe that uh, we need a lot of support from the outside. It's an intrinsic belief. Intrinsic belief. And if we can come out of that, you know, in, in relationship counselling, if, if one partner can, you know, the guy is holding off and not saying what's going on, but he's actually not happy that his girlfriend has been criticising him about the cooking or whatever it is, you know, but he's not saying anything. He's just carrying that as a kind of grumpy kind of thing and somewhere not really giving it to her and she knows... And his belief system, his inner world, is that he's right to do that because she should just see. She should come and see what's going on and why you're upset with me and what's going on. And she's just in her own trip maybe of, oh, it's another man that doesn't really give it to me or, or whatever it is. You know? And actually the, the way forward is for him to change and start to communicate what's happening and to start to speak about his needs. You know, that I felt upset when you criticised me about the cooking. And I find that after that, I start to disconnect from you. That's my old way of sort of paying back, like my dad, or whatever it, whatever it was, you know. But it's useful to look in your own life with, with friends, at work, you know, with lovers. If, are you communicating adequately? Are you communicating adequately what's going on inside? Or do you expect the outside, in some form or other, of the person or society, to just give it to you? To just give it to you? Yeah. If we, at some point, I cut myself actually doing what you're saying about the lot, like the, the blaming thing, you know? Like, yeah. whenever something is not going right in a relationship, in the workplace, I'm like, oh, it's their fault. And uh, so how I can work, like, how I can dive, like, somewhere inner to work better on that, like, improving that aspect? You just take responsibility. Take responsibility. Yeah, yeah, when you see yourself blaming, yeah. you just sit down and say, well, what could I do? Yeah. What could I do to move this situation forwards? Because in blame, of course, it's one of the... E I learned blame is a... My brain's hardwired to blame, it seems like, sometimes. You know, but, but the instant a feeling is provoked in me that I'm not comfortable with, that I don't want, when I was younger, I would immediately put judgments and blame on the outside. You know, immediately. It's like... Because if you can displace the point of change, then you diminish the sense of, you know, the psychological intensity of having to take responsibility. You know? You can diminish, you know, it's the government's fault. It's this person's fault, it's that person's fault, you know. It's, uh, as long as you can do that, you feel good. You know, if you, if you have to take responsibility, it's like, it's fucking challenging. You know, it's much easier just to say, well, you know, if that's society, you know, it, that, that's the government, they should have fucking got it together, you know, should have fucking got it together, not my fault, mate. You know, it's much easier to do that than to say, hmm, what, what in this personal situation for me, what could I do? 
Yeah. It's really interesting. And I'd like you to get back to the difference between the child mode mm. that you were saying, yeah. which is about expecting mm. others to be able to intuit yes. what needs exactly. and not needing to express yeah. them. Please. You want me to say it again? No, I want you to elaborate. You're elaborate on that. Continuing on that before you, you know, you oh, okay. sidetracked. Like, okay. Together, you know, all that. I think we were getting to the end of that bit anyway. But um, it's an as aspect of child mode, you know, that because as children we need to receive so much when, when, from the outside, from the parents, basically. You know, because we need to receive so much, when there are wounds that happen in that time and then those wounds are reactivated, by, by something going on when we're adults, it's very easy, not always, but it's very easy to go back into a belief system that, you know, the outside should give it to us. The outside should give it to us. And just being aware of this can be useful because we can look in our own lives, you know, where do, where do we end up in judgments? Particularly in love relationships, it's very, very common. Very, probably the, the, the number one factor, I'm not statistical statistician, but in my opinion, it'd be the number one factor why relationships break up, actually. Feeling like the other person doesn't understand me. Yes. And you not. My wife doesn't understand me. Yeah. Not my responsibility to communicate anything that's going on inside. No, no, no. It's just my wife. She doesn't understand me. It was a very good excuse for one of my pickups. Uh huh. I used that one. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Uh, everybody. So just to try and hone you back in on focus. You know, your developmental kind of like topography that you're talking about, you know, the way things develop. When does that, you know, ability to. Uh, make clear my desires and express and develop? Uh, now. Okay, great. <laughs> great answer. But like in general, you're saying, you're, you're assigning the other one to be child and you, you gave it an age of five, you know? So oh, well, I, I don't like, know. Women I, seem to be roughly. better at doing that anyway than men, you know? You mean about needs, communicating? Communicating. Yes. Needs, so communicating yes. too. But yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah. What, what's the, because uh, that's a big one. What what's the, the age when it yeah when well, you, or what what can you can you identify more what technologies you know would make that uh, you know uh, help people me uh, and others so uh, to be able to state needs and communicate them clearly and do it without being aggressive or oh okay okay I got you yeah I mean I mean there are you know like uh, nonviolent communication. Marshall Rosenberg back in the seventies was like NBC was Jackson, like a, you've heard, heard of it you Jackson, know Jackson. where it was very useful I, I don't always find it so useful in therapy and stuff yeah. but in prisons for example where there's a lot of violent people people who are kind of hardwired as soon as there's a little instrument to come in they're just going to go smack basically or with a knife or something like that for those guys it really worked for them to be able to really articulate what's happening also in CBT cognitive behavioural therapy mm -hmm. often yeah, extreme cases like you know like you know, uh, my friend here you know, just said that uh, he, he has personal relationship experience with that happening. You yeah. Know, you have yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I've had it too. You know, so, you know, so without just going to, you know, something like nonviolent communication, which is basically developed to help Jews and Palestinians, uh, you know, which well, is extreme. It's, you know, not, it's or, not only that. I mean, it's I know, but it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful technology. Have you done it? Yeah, yeah I've done several workshops. and workshops. Okay. And, okay. Work. Yeah. It's in my marriage. Anyway, so what <laughs> can I tell you? It's a fault of the therapy, essentially. Yeah. No, <laughs> my, that's what I'm saying. What <laughs> strategies are there that aren't so extreme that, you know, like... Uh, well, it's no, I mean, all it is really is just, I think it's learning or, for or me. You know, because just your body base, so where in the body is, you know, what, what needs to be released in order for that naturally to flow or... Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, certainly, the more that you can get the, the charge out, child mode, communication, I mean, that's a good question. I've not been asked that question before. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, to, what you need to develop, what, ultimately what you want to get to is a place where you can communicate about what's happening without a charge in it. Mm -hmm. When you can just be, you know, this is what's going on for me right now, rather than, you fucking bitch, you make me feel like this. You know, when you're going to send the other person into, in, into a reaction, you probably are going to send the other person into a reaction. You know, it's to really, it's to really take ownership of what is happening for you. It's, like a, it's more like a meditation as I see it. Okay, you can even start with just, you know, practicing by writing stuff down, what is happening for me right now. Well, whatever works for you, you know, it's mm -hmm. just being able to say, what is happening for, for me right now is this. You know, it's like it's like taking a step back from the emotions in a sense, and and observing what's going on inside your inside your body state, inside your language, whatever, in, inside of you. You know, in your belief system, 
right now I find myself blaming you for this, that or the other or whatever, then you're kind of owning what's going on. You're talking about the negative thing that's going on inside of you, but you're owning it as well. You're not in any way trying to displace it onto the other person and making them wrong. It's, so it's being able to communicate with out of charge, but as terms of where that goes in the body, I don't know if it's specifically, I mean intuitively I would say the throat is a, is a good area to look because that's, that's a big communication centre. But to communicate without charge, you need to have less charge. And this charge that, that we get charged about stuff does come from this repression in the body. You know, and it's, it's, to, it's also to look. Particularly for men, we often like to hold a charge. You might be a little bit in that category perhaps, I don't know. We like to hold a charge in the body because it makes us feel alive. You know, we get, we get excitement from it, from all this repressed stuff that we're holding inside. You know, it makes us feel alive to be under stress, to, to, to be charging about the place. But in the long run, it's, it's not really viable. You know, it burns us out. It burns our body out. I really like the idea of... Um, so, I think you were talking earlier about a guy who's just an ex, you know, expert in Buddhism and meditation, but he sort of detached. And probably all of us have met people like that. You know, they're big into meditation, mm. but they're sort of detached from their emotion. And the trick is to sort of witness the emotion, own it, and don't detach from it, and be able to communicate it without being affected by it and without bringing the negative energy associated with it into the communication. Mm. Um, I've, over the last couple of days, that, that's been felt a little bit more able to do that, mm -hmm. just through some of the release exercises that we've done. Mm. So I can be more confrontational with people without that energy mm -hmm. coming through and polluting the communication. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Totally. I couldn't say it better myself. Mm. And it also creates change as well, because if someone's communicating with you, trying to give you feedback with a charge, you probably won't take it in very much. You probably won't mm. listen to it, you know, mm. because in your mind you can feel the charge. And although you're kind of half listening to them to give them a bit of respect and they'll probably get pissed off if you don't listen and take in what they're saying, you're not really treating it with any uh, as though it's authentic because you can feel they've got a charge. Mm. I had a client not long ago in the group and uh, she was very busy with trying to change stuff around abuse that had been going on uh, in, in child, childhood abuse and she was trying to make new laws for the council to do this. And what she found was people just wouldn't listen to her. They just wouldn't listen to her. And when we discussed more and she was in the group room, it became clear that she started such a personal wound and a personal charge, but she was trying to change the council system, the world outside, but she hadn't cleared her own wound. And so when she would communicate with people, even her family or whatever, or council people about these things, they would all kind of just blank and negate what she was doing. Because somewhere we know when someone's coming from a clear place, or when they're coming from, that actually it's a personal wound, they're trying to change the outside, mm -hmm. you know. And likewise, when you do communicate, like you're saying, like you're saying, it's like from this clear space where you're just talking about what's going on for you, it's much easier for someone else to receive that. And then they may introspect and say, wow, I really was getting out of, out of control there. And I, hey, I'm sorry, babe, I've been really judgmental about your cooking or whatever it is. And for me, NBC did a lot. Mm -hmm. that. I got a real, a real sense mm -hmm. of that spaciousness around things because... Mm -hmm. You acknowledge that there's something in you that's like triggered, mm. but you don't come at that person. You sort of talk around it, so you're like, I feel that I own exactly what you're saying. You know, mm. I, I get triggered when I hear other people say, when they're talking about themselves, but they say, you know, you know, when you do this and then you feel this, and then that, and it's all others. It's like, no, that's yours. Mm. And that language, it's like, you know, so if I say, I feel like this, and this is my experience. Mm. That person then has a space to sort of reflect on it without feeling like they're being attacked. Mm. And the ego, the first thing the ego wants to do is protect itself. Yeah. Beyond truth, beyond whether they genuinely mm. have you know bad hygiene or are rude or obnoxious mm -hmm. or something, and someone comes at them with some kind of feedback which is positive, mm. you know, it's a positive thing to say, hey, you know, you're really offensive right there. You know, and they're like, fuck you, mm. straight away because they feel like they're being attacked. Mm. And then you don't get what you want, which is ultimately better communication with them. Mm. And they don't they end up walking away being angry at you for being obnoxious. To them or whatever, you know, it's, yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's like a massive fail, fail. And actually, you know, you, what you wanted was to say, hey man, I want you to be a better person, like for me and for you, 
you know, ultimately. Yeah. But you can't do it straight. It doesn't work. Yeah. There's too, there's too many layers. There's too, and there's too much sensitivity. Mm. Like, for where, wherever it comes from, whether it's childhood or just they're, they're tired, whatever. Yep, no, exactly. Exactly, thank you. Uh, something that I well, back to the child mode, something last that I wanted to add. I remember in the previous workshops you mentioned that sometimes a man or a woman, or let's say a man, he loses his job or somebody dumps him, uh, which in my case that happened. Yeah, talk about yourself, that's good. Uh, like something that happened recently is like, let's say I experienced a breakup and it happened the thing that it says, like I kind of felt, started feeling small. The, 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 the self esteem, like uh, or negative self talk about that. What, what I deserve and then what I don't deserve mm. because uh, that thing happened and it felt like the thing that you were talking in the previous workshop that you said that sometimes like we tend to go into childhood again when somebody leaves us and I can see that it hap- it ha- it's happening to me like after that it's, it has been like seven months and okay I'm doing better I, but I'm feeling that like still a bit small you know after that happened I'm projecting the future oh my god what if I'm not going to be able and all these like ideas start going on mm. generally like a sm- small uh, a small aspect of myself mm. is getting like smaller, you said, in childhood. So how how I can turn this around and work about it or process that and just take an adult position after what happened? Mm. Well, you know, this, 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 the feeling of being small is probably sitting inside of you as well anyway from a, some kind of defensive strategy, rather like low self-esteem, you yeah. know. Keeping ourselves small behaviourally is a way to protect, you yeah. know. So, you know, you just look at, keep taking risks and expanding, getting the support you need. You know, it's, life is a developmental journey. And you can look, you know, these muscles that get activated by doing this kind of position, they're the kind of muscles where people keep their head down to yeah. stay safe, you know? With me, I see that I have like a, a, so much aching, like even in this area here, there's like a lot of tension because I feel even work sometimes or uh, people confront me, I tend to unconsciously. Raise my shoulders. You know? Yeah, so yeah. I'm protecting yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was always a similar body pattern. You know, it's just working these muscles and also taking challenges to go out in yeah. the world. I like the combinations of both. Yeah, you covered it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that's one aspect of child mode. This kind of um, expecting the other to see us when actually we need to communicate. The adult communicates about their inner state and what's going on for them. Uh, another interesting aspect of child mode that particularly does relate to um, underachievement, I think, is something I noticed. I mean, yes, another big area of underachievement actually really is, is low self-esteem, of course, of, of this protection, taking a protective attitude towards the self and developing a low self-image, developing a small self-image from up here, developing a bad self-image, stuff like this, as a protection to really going out into the world and opening, you know. I still see when, 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 when doing, leading the bow, you know, a lot of people, they, 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 they close their chest instinctively, they close their chest mm-hmm. instinctively, which on a physical level is, is a protection movement, you know, not having the chest open. You know, when we've been working, working at a belly level, as you get more energy and awareness into your belly, then you don't need to exert so much control from your mind. You know? And so you can, you can start to open up more and feel that you're safe. This is really, the, for me, the, the core is you need to feel safe. You know? if, you don't, if you don't feel safe in your own body, you know, then you will always use these mental strategies to avoid. You okay there? Do you want to breathe more or, or, or shake a bit or are you? No, I'm just realising shit. No, I'm, not, okay. <laughs> I'm just allowing it to be there at the moment. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. So cool. That's cool. So, yeah, you know, it, I think it's important for us to work at giving ourselves this feeling of basic bodily safety, you know. And bioenergetics is a, is a great way to, to start to do that. But it does involve a lot of, you know, going through shit, going, going mm-hmm. through discomfort. In a sense, it's almost, you know, becoming familiar with discomfort and understanding it, becoming familiar with pain and learning how to work intelligently with it as opposed to just avoid it. Because in this kind of body-based, body-based field, the more that you can feel your body, the more that you are familiar with the whole range of sensations and emotions in the body, 
and the more okay you are with them, then the more psychologically healthy you are. Simple as that. You know, you don't get so yeah, things trigger you, but it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't end up sending you back down. Because when we look at uh, like like I saw yesterday, the, we showed yesterday the anxiety thing. You know, when we're afraid of our inner world, it's hard to move out into the world mm -hmm. because something triggers us, and we just think, no, I'm not going to encounter that. You know. Yeah. For years, I wouldn't give feedback to people because I thought, I don't know, they might say something back to me and I don't want to hear it. You know, I wouldn't take the risk to go, to go forwards and, and confront, you know, because I was in fear they might say something bad to me and then I'm going to kind of, in, the feeling inside me was like I was going to collapse and almost die and shrink into a little ball if someone said something bad to me or someone gave me certain feedback, which is really my own fears about myself in many ways. And slowly, bit by bit, we have to overcome this and the body work the body work is a big part of that, you know, getting the chest more open, you know, getting the chest more open so you feel like, hey, you know, I can, I can, I can hold space for myself, really, I can hold space for myself. I'm familiar with my inner world. Coming out of low self-esteem, understanding that it's a protection, basically, it's a protection. And it's an, an adaptive strategy and taking responsibility for it. You know, the, a lot of this stuff to me just comes down to having to take responsibility for things and to work on them slowly in a graduated fashion. And then a particularly interesting area of underachievement and child mode that I've noticed in my own work as a therapist is the kind of taking yourself hostage. I don't read psychological journals much and stuff, but I've never really encountered many, so many other people talking about this, but working with people, and particularly people who wanted to achieve more, it, it was a very, very dominant factor in the group room. Mm -hmm. but, uh, for me, when, I, when, when my, when my mum left, I had a kind of protest somewhere with my mother and then with women somewhere later on in my life where I wouldn't really give it to them as a form of silent protest. Again, similar child mode, withholding what I think they want, withholding. You know, and getting a, you get a sense of power when you withhold. You, know, you get a sense of power when you withhold. And in like manner, very often what you see in the underachievement is that they're paying back the parents, usually. They're paying back one parent or both by not achieving, by not developing. You know, most parents want their kids to do good in life. You know, they may go a rather bad way about trying to achieve that, or a rather unenlightened way about trying to achieve it, but nevertheless, the intention is that they, you know, they, they're, trying to, they're trying to get the kids to really step up and be good and have a great job. Yeah, it might be a bit archaic, you know, they're obsessed with them becoming a lawyer or a doctor or what were good jobs when they were kids and stuff like this. You know, but they are at some level trying to get the kids to be really great, you know, so that they feel good about their offspring, basically. And as a protest measure, often what the kids will do when they're grown up is refuse to achieve. Mm -hmm. Just refuse. Just totally fucking refuse to achieve. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, something that I want to say in my case, I'm starting to bring in awareness to me, it's the same thing with my parents. As I grew up, they were always like was having this like frame of mind, like, you should do that or go study to make us proud. And I was like really taking this like rebellious mentality. Mm. And even though like sometimes when I was going somewhere to study and I could see people will give me positive feedback, you're doing actually great and you're great with your performance, I will self-sabotage and I will like say, fuck this shit, I'm going to do my own thing. And it's like that, the thing that you're saying, paying back the cards. Yeah. And I can see even in my behavior outside and social interactions with people, I'm having this like rebellious thing, oh, I'm just going to show them, but it's actually, I can see that it's coming in from my parents. Well, the rebellious thing ca can also work. It's, yeah. this, is, that's, this is part of it. Yeah. You know, paying back the parents. Yeah. But in this case, it's deliberately refusing to achieve anything. Ah. You know, as a form of silent protest to, towards the parents. To say, you were such an arsehole when I was growing up, Dad. Look at me now. I'm still smoking weed at 42 and I've got long dreadlocks. Look at me. That's the state of me and it's your fucking fault. You know, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the kind of what's really going on on a psychological level. But you and say also, sorry to interrupt you, that you say also maybe it's also a healthy part of the rebellious thing. Yeah, well, it can be. Thing, right? It can yeah. be to do, go and do your own thing and to ah, become, yeah. to really do what you want to do. Okay. You know, the rebellion can, can also be useful. Yeah, I like that. 
Uh, and most of us don't have the parents who are really good authority figures, you know. They, they, mine came out of the post-war era. I mean, I, had, I consider I had no positive experience of authority growing up, you know. As far as in my child mind, authority had taken me away from my parents, real parents, given me other parents, one of whom was quite abusive, fucked up, you know, I, I could blame, 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 blame. I had no positive experience of authority, so I just assumed that all authority was wrong and just needed to be confronted, you know, and told how wrong it was, you know. That was my assumption. So then I was a punk and dropped out of society, got into conspiracy theories, all of this kind of stuff, you know. It was just because I didn't have a positive experience of authority. And because few of us do have such a positive experience of our parents, we, we find some way often to pay them back. And these kind of silent protests are the most debilitating for our development. Because if you just scream and shout at the parents and get really pissed off, at least something is moving, you know, at least something is moving. But when you're just silently hostile, withdrawing, not giving, you know, nothing is moving, nothing is moving. It's just this refusal to give or move. So it can be useful, maybe a bit later, to, to introspect about areas in your life where you, you are somewhere blaming someone for how, how you are now and paying them back. You know? It can be a useful exercise. Is there someone that you blame still for how you are now? Or society? Government? Capitalism, communism, whatever? Is there someone that you if blame? It's, if it's government, then so we trace it back to the parent again, right? We don't necessarily have to trace it back, you know, you can trace it back, but... If you basically believe that, you know, the reason I am not having the life I really want is because of the government, yeah. you know, then that is an avoidance. Avoidance. Yeah. Avoidance of taking responsibility and action. Yeah, of really looking for yourself. It's like an easy way out to, to, to de deflect the responsibility from yourself, you know. So these are just handy, handy little things to know. And can anyone think, well, what's, what's the solution for these guys who are taking themselves hostage who are, are just in a silent protest of their childhood. What's the solution? Awareness. Yeah. Partly. So really questioning and asking yourself are you where you want to be? Because I mean, are you happy? Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're ultimately happy being a rebellious, like, pot smoking dreadlocks 42 year old, then okay. Yeah. But if you're unhappy and you want to change it, then you need to know why and yeah. take responsibility. But with any form, yeah, no, it's, it's, to, it's, 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 it's totally true. I'm not quite giving enough information in terms of what I'm, 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 I'm driving towards, uh, which is one thing that's interesting in, in, in this kind of body-based therapy is any form of silent protest or mental behaviour, if you make it physical, it starts to change. Something can move, you know. When I have a lot of people in, the, in, in a group who I can spot, you know, they formed a little fifth column somewhere at tea break and they're all complaining about the group or about me or the staff or something like that. And, you know, they're sucking each other into their own little recruitment game of, of, of this, you know, for whatever reason. Something you can do is when next time you're in a group room, okay, guys, we're going to do complaining structure. Ten minutes, physically complain as much as you can. You know, totally works. When they're all blaming someone, get people to really physically start blaming. Any form of mental protest, if you make it physical, something can move. Something can move. So, you know, you do, you do, the, you, you do you know, 10 minutes of, uh, of complaining. Everyone goes around and just complains and complains about <laughs> everything. You feel like you've let it go because you've done it. And with these guys who are protesting, but they're protesting by withholding, you know, either from someone else, they're, they're, they're withholding from the parents what they believe the parents want to get from them, which is success. If you can get them to protest physically, to say, fuck you, dad, and fuck you, mum, and to scream it out really fully, then this holding is broken. Mm. It moves from silent withholding into positive protest, and then something can, something can, there can be a cycle, a uh, movement can happen. Yeah. Movement can happen. You can't really develop when you're, you're, you can't, like, anyone heard of the cycle of grief? Liz Kubler-Ross, back in the 70s, she worked out a cycle of five emotional phases that a human being who's experienced great grief, oh, great grief, can go through, denial. you know, yeah, denial, a bit of anger, yeah, or, uh, depression, or something. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember, dab or something was the uh, anagram, but um, but in, in like manner, you know, for anyone to process, we go through phases, you know, we go through phases, but those phases are are, are experiential. If you're just holding, if you're just refusing, you know, you can't really develop, you can't process anything. You can't process. And this is why so many, this is a big area why a lot of people never really get up and achieve what they could achieve. Mm -hmm. They're caught up in some payback drip 
towards the parents. Right, okay. Do you think that that's very typical of like English, specifically sort of English Northern European people? More than say like North Americans that are perhaps more expressive, the, the silent protest is sort of the stiff upper lip that we kind of hold things in because that's strength. Mm. You, know, you don't cry because mm. crying's weak. Mm. And that's sort of inbuilt. I see that in my parents and mm-hmm. my, like all the older parts of my family. You know, it's not okay to talk. Yeah. It's like they, they always talk about things that it's like they're holding back like a volcano. You know, they're like, it's not right. You know, it's not right. And then there's something wrong. And you're like, fucking just chill out. Don't you know, have a heart attack or anything. Because it's like, it's so there. And they're kind of older. So they're ready, in a way, they sort of want to get rid of it. I mean, we've got 60, 70 years of it building up. But they can't. Because it's not okay. Yeah. And if that's uh, yeah. something that really is more prominent here, in our culture, this kind of side of rebellion. That makes sense to me. You know, I don't know because I don't work all around the world, but I mean, it does make sense to me. I remember it just reminded me of going up north to run, actually to do a group uh, many years ago and in um, Hen- Hen- Hempton Bridge or somewhere like that. And we were on this old farmhouse and then the woman who's running the group was talking about how none of the farmers within a 10 mile radius had spoken to each other for six generations because they were all pissed off with each other. And, they, and, and I, probably none of them could even remember what they were actually pissed off about like 200 years before, but they were still maintaining this kind of total withhold, you know. And then, then, you know, even if someone just goes to the other farmer in an extreme situation and beats them up, at least they've fucking done something, you know, at least you've moved, made a movement, you know. You know, it's like, but if, if, if you're refusing to even do anything, you know, it's very, very difficult if you're caught in these games. Yeah. But it makes sense to me that in Britain, yeah, yeah this slip up a lift, it's true, I hadn't thought of that. You know, that kind of, yeah, emotional, you know, It can drawing. be a bit of a contagion as well, unfortunately. Um, I spent some time in Ireland And it was like, I, I was new, there was no reason why he didn't have to be frosty with me in any way, but he was totally like that. And it almost felt, I remember just thinking, oh, so this is what's normal around here. This is what's normal, I need to yes. change and be like this mentality. I, I knew what that wasn't wrong, but I just remember feeling that I, I was kind of gravitated that direction. Mm. It's a funny thing. Yeah, it's curious. Farmers do seem to get it quite strongly. I don't know. Even the farmers around here, but one of them's quite pissed off on us a lot of the time. Something that I wanted to ask you that is that, like, many times, like, uh, also, like he said, it, it conditions where I live in Germany, for example, like, most of the people are like that. They're, like, very silent, like, very stubborn. And uh, it, it, for you, like, experiencing that every day and seeing people reacting weird to you when you show any emotion, like you said, it, you think that it's normal. Like, it's like some sort of delusional way. And you think that's like life. And, it can condition you. Yeah, well, they, they, yeah. I mean, you, you might you might do, end up doing the same to fit in or whatever. I mean, yeah. Probably on some genetic level, it, it, it was a survival strategy of some type. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, you know, the main thing is is to is, is is to move to move beyond it. I think. You yeah. Know, but, so, but and it's a useful strategy to understand for yourself if you're caught up in a silent protest. If you can make the protest really physical, which is often what people really don't want to do. In child mode, you know, they want to hold on to the old, the old grievance, you know, and, uh, and and not talk about it, not not allow it to be released. They they draw a feeling of power from this this this, this grievance, but it's not healthy. So you know, it can be useful if you're working with people in some situation, you see that going on, get them to act out the negativity physically in a safe way, or in your own life, if you catch yourself just grumbling and complaining all day, spend ten minutes in your room just freaking out, complaining like crazy, you know, just let your mind complain and blame and do its whole trip, have some catharsis with it, you know, yeah. and then you probably find after that, ah, ah, now I can just open my heart a bit more and, and move into the next step in life. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think um, that's got to be about enough information for, for, a, for a, another session. With, with all of this stuff, you know, it's not like you have to remember everything. I used to find, like, the stuff I need kind of goes in somewhere. Yeah. Or sometimes the stuff I need, I blank out the most, you know. But, like, uh, <laughs> but that's how part of how life is. So, you know, you can, you know, it's, it's the stuff, hopefully the stuff you need will somewhere come in, you know, that's useful for you right now in this moment. We are all doing all of these things a lot of the time, I certainly am. Yeah. And uh, trying, hopefully, to catch myself in it. Has anyone got any questions or other sharings from their experience that they feel when we're, we're on camera at the minute? If it's useful, I think that 
for my, I'll, I'll use I statements for myself, but I think that it happens in general. When conflicts that arise out of the situations and conditions that you've talked about, you know, happen, I think, with me at least, uh, sometimes pushing towards conflict, escalating it towards conflict, is intuitively a strategy because I know intuitively that making it physical will start to move it. Mm. So, I mean, I, I noticed that in myself, that, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, I've done that, uh, mm. is escalated things towards conflict, physical or otherwise, mm. you know, just to, you know, uns get a situation unstuck. Mm. Uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know how ultimately constructive it is, you know, so. I, well, it's just another stage of a journey, you know. I mean, I mean ideally, what you, what you want to do is be talking about the thing. It's mm. like, a, you know, if, it, if it's relating that here and now to someone or something like that, to be talking about it, you know. But uh, certainly to have, yeah, to, to be able to, if you're aware that you're isolating and holding something inside, now, yeah, maybe it does come out badly with a charge to start with, but then at least something is moving and a dialogue can start of some form. You know? This is great. This is like preventative. So this is getting yourself in the zone that it never happens in the first place but if it is if it does happen as we're all human and, mm. you know we're probably going to get ourselves in that situation yes fight or flight response is kind of built up yeah is there any yeah. sort of intervention strategies that you guys have kind of practiced or recommend is just to i suppose taking stock you mean when you're triggered by when, something when you are when it's too late and you're already there you're triggered and you're in a reaction well, I guess, you know, first of all, it's to look, are you in safety? You know, are, are you safe, actually, physically safe? You know, do you feel safe? And, uh, and, and if you do, but you're in a big reaction, you know, to find some way to, to come back from that, it's just human stuff, really, to start to say, hey, wait a minute, I realise I'm really charged and maybe I'm just charging down the wrong road. I need a little bit of time to think about this. Uh, you know, I don't have the solution right now, whatever. Or, or to say, hey, you know, I think... Being willing to come back and apologise is really a human, a useful human quality. But to check that that apology is coming is, is really authentic. You know, that it's it's really what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, because you yeah, know so life is triggering. It's triggering as fuck. You know, it's yeah. meant to be triggering. Basically, it's not meant to be as I see it. You know, it's yeah, it's a developmental sorry, arena. You know, it's a developmental the, arena. The physical release, like the punching pillows, and yeah, like that. It's worked so powerfully in the last month. Mm -hmm. Like it just, I'm less, I still get triggered by things, but there's less of a charge. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think I've, dis, I've, mm. de, I've sort of depressurized that tank so that mm. when someone comes in and does something that triggers me, it's exactly. like, it doesn't make such a big wave in, in, in that pond. Yes. Um, and so then I kind of, you know, I will, especially with people that I know I just, I'm, ne I'm never going to get to a level of like relating with them. Mm. You know, it's just like not feasible really that I'll get what I want from that mm. communication. It's like they just are who they are, mm. you know? Mm. And the reason we have problems is because they are who they are and they won't change. So it's just like, you know, physically releasing that anger and like you yeah. said about the just go you know, just complaining, you wouldn't yeah. complain about shit or physically complain. It works so well. So I hold sometimes those people in my head, my mind when I'm doing some of that physical stuff. And it, it does just dissipate that energy and that charge for me. And then when I see them I don't feel like like I want a confrontation. Yeah. I don't feel like I yeah. need it. I'm just like, yeah, you are who you are. You know, I don't want to hang out with you, <laughs> but you are who you are. Yeah, yeah. I'm less like in need of exactly. resolution. I feel like I've yeah. resolved it. I think the other interesting thing is that so there was a fight or a flight response to me. So on the cerebral cortex, so it's the way in the cerebral cortex in your body. It's, it's a charge. It's more, this is more yeah. to do with the charge. Mm. In, 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 but like, like, like um, chap here mm. was saying, you know, when, when this charge is sitting in your body, often it become, you become a bit like a missile, you know, you, and you almost seek out the situations where you can lay your trip, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because the charge is in your body, yeah. and then you feel like, I'm right, I'm fucking right yeah. here, I'm going to fucking tell them, you know, yeah. and, and this kind of, but all it is, is the charge trying to find a way out from the midbrain, from the so midbrain. It's a physical level as well, yeah. isn't it? The stuff that is happening is the endocrine system gets activated, so the hormones get released, adrenaline gets released. Yeah. Body. Yeah. Your, part, your sympathetic yeah. nervous system gets yeah. activated, ready to fight, or, or you know. Yeah, but that, that's that's because of the so, charge. Yeah, yeah. So that charge happens in everything in the body. So in terms of because once you've triggered and you've gone there, you know it's the point you reach a point of no return. 
you can't be away at that point. You know you're there, you're acting out, that's it, it's gone. It's bringing that awareness of actually, if you bring awareness to your body, what is happening in my body? So there will be specifically for every individual, specific, isn't it? Specific um, physical symptoms, so to speak. So, you know, some people really, really tense. Yeah. Some people start, you know, they're, they're you know, they get their fists get like this. You know, some people start sweating, yeah. you know, shaking. Yeah. All of that stuff happens before your body, you know, gets this charge. You know, yeah, really strong. Tension yeah, and then, and is very, very big. Yeah. So as soon as you become aware of it, this is the point when you can stop. But, it, but you've got to ask yourself, is it useful to stop as well? Well, it's useful that, that's if the thing. you're about to hit someone. If you're about to hit the environment, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, that, that, then it's useful to yeah. stop. But yeah. it's like, you've got to be a little bit careful for me. I just have to say it, you know, in, in relying too much on the neurology of it, because I find it comes on a deeply personal level at the end of the day. If I take responsibility for the charge in my system and, and do the release work, you know, that I need to get the charge out, then I am I am not charged. I don't I, I don't need to kind of um, go out into the world and protect myself a lot. I, I studied anger management for a while because I wanted to get a diploma and, and uh, I did this, and it had elements of CBT in it, which were quite useful in in learning how to diffuse anger by reframing the trigger the trigger area of anger before you go fully into it. You know, but what I also understood was, and it's the same with NVC a little bit. The danger is that you end up in disconnected from your emotions mm -hmm. and reframing stuff with your inner narratives too much. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's, you know, but because, because I have to come from the body based approach, which is quite emotional, physical, going out into the world, yeah. basically, it's, it's not so much about regulating your behavior, except, of course, when, no, when no. you are talking about very violent yeah. people I or extreme people. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. You know, absolutely. that's a good approach. Yeah, yeah, it's important that you're not. And then yeah. having those strategies in place, yeah. you know, maybe become aware of your breaths, you know, breathe deeper. Yeah. You know, activate that the parasympathetic nervous system. You know, yeah. When you're there. When you have a history yeah, of yes. violence, yeah. Yeah. Because usually it's hardwired to a degree, or, or, or our first experience, we maybe received a lot of violence, most violent people received a lot of violence. And they learn, they got, for as soon as the trigger comes in, bang, they're, they're, they're out there, and then they're in prison or whatever. And sometimes it doesn't yeah. even have to be violence like this, it doesn't mm. have to be physical, you know? You're just about to lose it, you're going to really make a complete ass of yourself by screaming and shouting at the other person. And afterwards, they're going to be really sorry because that person didn't deserve it. Well, you feel guilty. Too far, yeah. You know, so that's yeah. just that, isn't it? You kind of you lose yeah. it completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the thing is, you know, it's like to say, because you're right, you know, you're right, totally right, you know, you don't want to be creating a massive drama at the party or whatever with your big rage, you know, but at the same time, it's also not just to rely on that technique, but to say, hey, there's a charge in my system and I need to take responsibility or ideally I can take responsibility to get the charge out. Then I won't need these management techniques anymore. Yeah. Because exactly, exactly. Because they're, they're all stabilising effects, but they're not addressing the issue. Mm. They're not addressing the issue on a core, core level. Yeah. Something that I observed that you said, like when you were talking about this, like when you said, is it like necessary to stop? And then you said that it's becoming personal. Something that I want to say, let's say we are like in a situation you know, with people who are at the work or with someone, like they're doing something that like, uh, and co coming across about the boundaries that we don't like. And for some reason, we call it trigger, call it whatever you want. We realize that we feel uncomfortable. And uh, the thing that you said, if it's necessary to stop. so. You mean that maybe it's not necessarily the sound. Do you think like we should confront them? In terms of like the thing that you're doing right now, it's making me feel uncomfortable. Yeah, well, I mean, li life, is a, life is an experience, you know? Yeah. I mean, if I, I think if, for me, if I feel like I'm going to be violent towards someone or something, I don't have so much history of violence. Yeah. You know, I can be quite aggressive and angry and, and, and sometimes a bit abusive in my past. But if I don't think I'm going to be, I, mean, I think it's good to go out and have the experience. You know, you don't yeah. need to manage your emotionality exactly. all the time, except uh, uh, as lady here says, you know, when it get, when it's liable to go into really horrible stuff. Yeah. But you know, fuck, you want to go through life feeling like I fucking lived. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to be NVCing yourself and CBTing yourself way through life. You know, and you end up kind of like eight years old thinking, shit, I've been such a perfect human being, but have I really fucking experienced anything? You know, it's like that. Mm, so it's, yeah, not so, like, it's not so fucking great, hey? You know, it's like, mm. the, these strategies are just that, you know, to, to manage the extremities. They're not to 
to really get out and fucking live, you know? It's enjoy like, it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. do, do it. Get, that's what, to me, what the world's here for. That's what it started off with, you know? Mm -hmm. Let's leave it there for the recording anyway.